Hello, welcome back. Now that we have a better understanding of how to compute uh, return and how to compute risk for individual stocks as well as for the portfolio, we can put those information together and help us to establish a more vigorous understanding of the trade-off between risk and return. We're going to introduce a few um, concepts and also many definitions in this particular part of the lecture. So what we have seen earlier is that when we have as few as two stocks, we can combine those two stocks into a large number of different portfolios. So let me uh, go uh, review this briefly. Remember these particular tools that we have in your lecture notes. So we said we can change the number of weights for stock A and stock B. In fact, every time we use a different set of weights, we create a new portfolio. So for example, if we set the weight to 50-50, this is one portfolio. And this particular portfolio has an expected return of 6.35% and a standard deviation of 10.5%. Now I can create another portfolio by putting 20% in stock A and 80% in stock B. That portfolio has an expected return of 4.7% and a standard deviation of 7.3%. I can do a 10%, 90%, um, a 70%, 30%. As you can see, I can easily create 5, 10, 20, in fact, an infinite number of portfolios just using combinations of two stocks. And each portfolio that I create will have a different expected return and a different standard deviation. Those sets of portfolios, we call them feasible sets of portfolio. Feasible here means I can, I, it's possible to create those portfolios. And even if the portfolios, portfolio one is created using 10.5% in stock A and 89.5% in stock B, and the next one is 10.6% in stock A and so forth, they are still feasible. So feasible just means that we can we can create them. And you can have a very large number of feasible set of uh, portfolios. Not all, however, not all of these portfolios are created equal. So remember what our objective is. Our objective is we're assuming that we don't like risk and we like return. And this is a relatively non-controversial assumption. If you ask most investors, they will say, yes, I'd like to have a high return, and no, I don't like to take risk. So if I can get as high a return as I can without taking a lot of risk, that will be the best thing. So once we have created this feasible set of portfolio, then we can search through them and find the portfolio that has the smallest variance or the smallest standard deviation. And we call that the minimum uh, risk or the minimum variance portfolio. And from there on, from once we have the feasible set and then we have the minimum variance portfolio, then we can select the portfolio that, that, we, is, that we consider the best. And we give those set of portfolio a name. We call that the efficient frontier. So let's take a look at what does that mean. A graph may, may do a better job of explaining this than just words. So this is a graph we call that an efficient frontier. So in fact, um, the feasible set includes more stocks than this. So you could have combination, any combination along in this curve, in this graph is a feasible set. So every cross, every dotted line is a feasible set. However, as we said, not all, all portfolios are created equal. In this graph, we have on the y-axis the return, the average return, and on the x-axis is the risk. So as you can see, on the x-axis is the risk. So if you want to find the portfolio that has the lowest risk, we want to move along the x-axis. So as you can see, if I call this portfolio A, portfolio B, you'll see that portfolio B has a lower risk than portfolio A. In, f in fact, if you look at all the possible, all the feasible portfolio, this portfolio has the lowest risk. So this is our minimum variance portfolio. 
or the minimum risk portfolio. So it has the lowest risk. Once we have the portfolio that has the lower risk, next we want to look at portfolios that have different returns. So let's say this is portfolio A here, and this is portfolio D, and both of them has the same risk. So if you are choosing between portfolio A and portfolio D, you will want to have portfolio D because portfolio D has a higher return, but both portfolio A and portfolio D has the same risk. So once you have the minimum variance portfolio, and you look at all the other portfolio, you want to choose the portfolio as high as possible on the feasible set. So in fact, this curve here represents a curve that connects all the portfolios that has the highest possible return at any given level of risk. And this line here, starting with the minimum variance portfolio and the curve that is the boundary for the efficient, for the feasible, uh, for the physical portfolios, this is the one, what we call this the efficient frontier. So the efficient frontier starts with the minimum variance portfolio going all the way up. In fact, this is the most important basic principles of diversification. So what we saw in the example is that diversification can reduce risk without reducing expected return because we have many different possible portfolio we can create at the same level of risk and we have the choice to choose the portfolio that gives us the highest return at that given level of risk. So, but without combination, without portfolio, then we are stuck with a single stock. A single stock, you cannot change its risk and return characteristic. But when you combine stocks into portfolios, you can choose the weight distribution such that you can create a portfolio that has the risk return characteristics that you want. So by having more than one stock in a portfolio, we gain diversification benefits because one of the portfolio combination will give us a lower risk without sacrificing return. And the reason why we can reduce risk is because as long as the stocks are not perfectly positively correlated, the unexpected losses in one stock is offset by unexpected gains from another stock. However, you can see even at the minimum variance portfolio, the risk does not go to zero. And that represents the minimum level of risk that cannot be diversified away. And we give that risk a very special name. We call that the systematic risk. So systematic risk is risk that you cannot diversify away regardless of how much, how many, how many uh, stocks you put into your portfolio. So now when we look at an individual stock, so very careful throughout this, this, uh, this section is to distinguish between the risk of an individual stock and the risk of a portfolio. When we are talking about the risk of an individual stocks, it has two components. An individual stock has a systematic component and a diversifiable component. So for any individual stock, the total risk is given. This is the standard deviation of the stock. However, part of that risk can be eliminated through diversification. But part of that risk cannot. So the diversifiable risk can be eliminated through diversification. But regardless of how diversified portfolio you create, some risk will remain. And the risk that remain is called the systematic risk. Now, this is the case for an individual stock. So I want to emphasize that. Now, what about portfolio? In the case of a portfolio, you can actually eliminate all the diversifiable. So just a reminder, for individual stock, you always have the diversifiable risk and also systematic risk, so on an individual stock level. However, in a well-diversified portfolio, so at the the, at the portfolio level, the only risk that is left is systematic risk, as long as the portfolio is well diversified. Now, you can have an under diversified portfolio, and therefore, it may have some, some diversi diversifiable risk left. But if you have a well diversified portfolio, and there's really no reason why any investors do not construct their portfolio in such a way that is well diversified, the only risk left is systematic risk. 
So pay very close attention to the difference between individual stock versus portfolio. Since it makes sense to diversify, and it actually is imp very important that you can, investors construct well-diversified portfolios, let's take a look at the effects of diversification. So what we are going to look at is how does the total risk of the portfolio change as you increase the number of stocks in the portfolio. So here is the graph. If you have a single stock in, the, in this portfolio, the standard deviation is 49.2%. But if you increase the number of stocks in the portfolio from 1 to 10, the risk of the portfolio decreases substantially. As you increase the number of stocks from 1 to 30, the risk will continue to decrease. But you will see that between 30 to 40 stocks, the risk change very little. And in fact, you can go to 1,000 stocks and the change again is very marginal. And you can keep increasing the number of stocks in the portfolio, but you'll find that ultimately the risk we cannot really go down much beyond 19.2%. So what we are seeing here is that there's a substantial proportion of the risk that can be eliminated. So we call this the diversifiable risk. So the portion in pink is diversifiable risk that can be eliminated by increasing the number of stocks in the portfolio. However, the green, the blue part of the risk cannot be eliminated, and we call that this is the systematic portion. So this is the systematic risk. And there are many names for the two types of risk, and we're going to um, look at them in more details. So systematic risk, um, there, as I said, there are many names for it. Sometimes it's referred to as the non-diversifiable risk. Uh, another name for it is called the market risk. So the important thing to remember about systematic risk is that this is the risk factors that affect a large number of assets. So um, you, another name that you sometimes may see systematic risk being referred to is So first, let's take a look, deeper look at systematic risk. Uh, there are many other names uh, that we call uh, that we use to refer to systematic risk. One of them you've seen is called non-diversifiable risk. Sometimes it is referred to as the market risk because this is the, the risk of the entire stock market. Um, it's also referred to as beta. The, uh, by definition, systematic risks are risk factors that affect a large number of stocks, so, uh, and that is why they cannot be eliminated. Um, examples of systematic risks include things such as changes in the GDP, economic growth, inflation, interest rates. Um, there are also um, production factors that, that affects a large number of um, industries such as oil prices because it's hard to think of any industry that's not affected by oil. Um, so if you think of systematic risk, think of the uh, a factor that is common and you cannot go without regardless of what industry you're in. That's a systematic risk. Unsystematic risk are also called unique risk or firm-specific risk. So these are risk factors that affect a limited number of stocks. So oftentimes, these may include things that are unique to a company. Uh, one classic example is lawsuits. There are many, uh, many lawsuits between companies, particularly regarding patents. So for example, there are lawsuits between Apple and Samsung. In this case, if Apple wins, then Samsung loses. If you're an investor, you know, hold stocks in both Apple and Samsung, then the gain of one company will offset the loss of another company. So therefore, you can eliminate that particular risk by holding a diversified portfolio. Same is true for product failure, um, health and um, deaths of chief executive officers or managers. Uh, all those are examples that affect one company or maybe just a few companies in the industry, but not the economy as a whole. So that is a, a uh, more in-depth understanding of systematic and unsystematic risk. Now let's take a look at how the systematic risk and unsystematic risk relate to returns. 
So remember the return has an expected component and an unexpected component. So the part that is expected is not very risky because we this is what we expect. The part that is risky is the unexpected part. So now we can then further decompose the unexpected return into the systematic portion and the unsystematic portion. So our total return now then can be written as your expected return plus the systematic portion. So this is risky and you cannot eliminate that. But and also the unsystematic portion which is risky, but you can eliminate that. So this leads to a very important part that we're going to introduce next, and which is the systematic risk principle. So what we want to know is if we get return, um, sh should we get, we should get return for taking risk. So the main question we're going to address that next is do we get do we get reward for taking on systematic risk? And do we get reward for taking on unsystematic risk? The systematic risk principle says that there is a reward for taking risk. However, there is no reward for taking unnecessary risk. So because of that, and since we remember that any investors can form well diversified portfolios. So therefore, the expected return should only reward the systematic risk of the stock and not the unsystematic risk of the stock. So the, re the total return is equal to the expected return portion plus the systematic risk portion. The unsystematic risk portion should exactly equal to zero because there is no reward for taking unnecessary risk. Since systematic risk is the most important part, is the part that get, we get rewarded for, how do we measure it? The most common way to measure systematic risk is through regression analysis. So when you do regression analysis, um, traditional statistics oftentimes use the term beta coefficient. So that's why systematic risk is sometimes also called beta. So the beta coefficient refers to the systematic risk. We'll do a project specifically to show you how to compute beta using regression analysis. Here, we'll just take a look at what does beta tell us. So beta actually is a standardized num uh, variable as well. So we standardize beta around 1. When a stock has a beta equals to 1, that stock has exactly the same level of systematic risk as the overall stock market. And if the beta of a stock is less than one, then it says what we can conclude is that the stock has slightly less systematic risk than the overall market. And its beta of greater than one tells us that this, the asset has more systematic risk than the overall market. So now we have a much deeper understanding of risk, how to compute risk, and how to measure risk. In the next video, we're going to uh, propose the formal relationship, meaning an equation that will relate return to risk.